Okay, let's now take a look at Millikan's famous oil drop experiment. And now this is, this is one that I never really understood, I, I would say, like when I first learned this, but I think the experimental setup is really genius here. Um, specifically because what he does is creates a uh, kind of a, a suspension of little droplets of oil of a very uniform volume, and then we apply an electric field, and you basically can balance these little droplets of oil by balancing the, gravi the gravitational pull with the electric force that we induce. And th there's sort of some remarkable consequences from this, but it's really quite simple here. So, so let's just uh, talk about what, what we're going to do first of all. And we have this oil can here. <laughs> this is our oil can, and we can spray out a very fine mist of oil droplets. And um, we know what density oil has, and you can at least get a statistical sample of what the, of what the known radii of these little oil droplets are. And uh, one of the things that, that Milliken did was he actually literally had a microscope set up so that he could peer down the, the axis of this um, region where he's going to, going to apply the electric field. And so you can literally focus on one or a handful of these microscopic um, oil droplets, and you can watch what happens as you change the, the environment here. So we're, we're going to um, spray a fine mist in here. We're going to look at some of these droplets, and what happens rather quickly is they... Um, the, uh, as gravity pulls them down, there is going to be some small drag, and when we're talking about these small particles, we have to account for the fact that there is an atmospheric drag, and so they all tend to kind of, they reach, uh, you, uh, they, what's called, they reach terminal velocity at, uh, very quickly after they're sprayed out of the can, so they all kind of seem to fall down at a constant rate, you know, literally just down in, under the influence of gravity. But what we do now is we can apply an electric field. And specifically that electric field, we're going to induce in a downwards direction. And what we find when we peer through that microscope is that all of a sudden, when we, as they're falling, when we ramp up that electric field there, some of those droplets start to float. So I'll write this here, E. <clears throat> and it's important to note, it's only some of them. Not all of them do that. So depending on what the electric field strength is that you have created, some of those droplets actually will just keep on falling. Some of those droplets actually, depending on where you're at, some of those droplets might actually rise up and you don't see them again. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, again, focus on a couple of drops and we're simply going to vary the electric field until we can see that drop and maybe a couple neighbors nearby it, or, or we don't really care about that, but that drop alone is going to center in our field of view. The rest of those droplets, are we're going to let them finish either rising up or falling down, and they're going to kind of scatter out of the way. But we've now just found one, essentially a resonance of the electric field here that will keep one of these droplets perfectly still. And we're going to do the same thing over and over and over, keeping, for example, the size of the droplets the same, the distance between the plates the same, um, the atmospheric conditions, that's very important there for those to be the same, because that, that tells us what the atmospheric drag might be that we would otherwise have to overcome. Um, and it would also influence the surface gravity or the surface tension of these. So keeping everything the same, what we do is we, we repeat this over and over, and we find what the different resonances of the electric field are. And... That's kind of a cool thing, because this is our first hint that there is a, um, well, what we find, it, it, I'll, I'll, we'll graph this out here. Um, if we make a, a list of the resonances that work, there's many, of, we're going to get, you know, we're going to try it out over and over and over. Many of the, the electric field values we're going to get are going to be the same. We might get, it might require, let's say, 15 units, 15 newtons per coulomb, and 15.01. And, you know, I get something else, I get something else. Uh, fourth time, I get 15.01. And it keeps coming up over and over again. And then there might be another one, it might be uh, 7.85, you know, and that, that result comes up over and over, but not like 7.86 or not 7.83. 7.85 always comes up. And there might be something like 3.19 that we keep getting that over and over, not 3.20, not 3.14, 3.19, 3.19, 3.19. So it's this weird distribution of all of these seemingly like random numbers that we're getting. And so this is what it would look like. If we graph, for example, on the electric field axis, so this is just a histogram, uh, the number of trials where the electric field graphed here, the strength of it at least, will give us a, a floating particle. 
And now the, the number here isn't really important, but what is important is the fact that if we start at very high electric fields, for example, we're going to get some, you know, you're, you're going to turn as high as you can possibly get and keep on going down and down. And eventually you're going to, you're going to hit, um, or I'm not describing precisely what we do in the experiment, but you know, for each of these, you can start at the highest possible value and go down and you're going to find that there is some maximum number here, some maximum number where you're going to get a handful of particles of your sample of, let's say, a thousand that you have tested. Um, that's the highest one there. And then now when we move over here, you're not going to get any other values of E that, that hold up those particles until you get maybe about halfway down. So I'm going to, I'm going to write this here as, let's say, uh, I'm going to call this E1. So I'm going to number, number from the right down. And then now I'm going to get, maybe, maybe there's a few more here. E2, which is about halfway down, and then now, as it turns out, a little bit closer to that, about a third of the way, you might find a bunch of them. Again, the number doesn't matter, but E3, and then now here's E4, E5, E6. So we get a series of, of electric fields that, as you get closer to zero, they get exceedingly closer together. But each of these happens at a discrete given value and we don't see any electric fields that will make them float in between. So basically there is a bunch of individual peaks and it's zero everywhere else. So again, important to note that if you just choose a random value of E on this list, it's almost vanishingly unlikely that that exact value of E would have been one of the ones that floated at least a particle here. So, by the way, this looks an awful lot like elect, uh, energy emission lines or spectral emission lines. If you look at like a, a, um, a emission nebula out in space or like a, a neon gas lamp, um, it's for a very, very similar reason, though not precisely the same. But again, we get what we call basically delta functions or lines that are exceedingly narrow, but you have a whole bunch of them at that exact number. So what this tells us and, and looking at this this way here, um, turns out you can mathematically analyze these lines, and it's what forms a geometric series. And specifically, we get a whole bunch of values. Let's say you measure E1. What you find is that E2 will almost perfectly equal E1 over 2. What you find is E3 almost perfectly matches, I'll say it like this, 131. E4 equals a fourth E1, and so on. So you get some weird relationship where you can predict the, the allowed energies, if you will, that will balance a particle simply just by measuring that first one and dividing it by any integer fraction. One over N times E1. So this is the series that we get out here. And of course, it does tend towards zero as we get to small, uh, small energies. Why does this happen? So to understand why this happens here, I think we need to look, look down at a microscopic level, and we need to see exactly what is happening to that individual droplet of oil that allows it to hover there. And once we do that, we can put a meaning to why this series appears as it is. Okay, so let's look at a single oil droplet here. Now, this oil droplet, first of all, we know due to surface tension, it must be almost uh, perfectly spherical, and it's going to have some mass. If you, if you can measure the radius, for example, you can measure the, we know the density of oil, so you can measure the mass of these droplets and by, by, you know, using a microscope there. So let's call the mass of this oil droplet M. And we know because when we turn the electric field on, it, these, these uh, charged particles, or these, uh, sorry, when we turn the electric field on, these oil droplets begin to rise. And the only way that can be true is if they have some excess of negative charge. We know that neutral objects aren't affected by electric fields, so very clearly we know that these are negatively charged by the direction they move. So I'm going to call that big Q. And again, we understand that to be negative. So we have some overall charge on this and some overall mass. And if we can fine-tune the electric field, so that we get a perfectly balancing uh, droplet, what we, what we know must be true is that there must be some electric field, Fe. Remember, because it's negative, that's going to point up. That perfectly balances a gravitational force, Fg. 
And we know based on basic laws of physics, this is going to equal what, sorry, I need to use big Q here. This is gonna equal the charge of that droplet, big Q, times whatever the strength of the field is. And we know this is gonna equal the mass of the droplet times G. So when these two things are equal, we can set Fe equal to Fg, or what we get out here, I'll use the board up there, Qe equals mg. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set, uh, I'm going to rearrange this equation here. So we're going to see what electric field, E, will allow us to balance these two things. So we're, again, think of it, uh, sorry, Qe equals mg. Really, the only thing that we're varying here is the electric field, and we're going to see when, when these two things become equal to zero by seeing that thing stop uh, moving. So we're going to find that the electric field is going to equal, or the electric field that makes that hovering possible, equal mg over q. And here's where our results start to kind of make a little more physical sense. What we find is that instead of a continuous distribution, so instead of the number of, of trials that allowed us to hover it versus E, instead of that being like a bell curve like that, which would mean in that case that charge is continuous, is how we would interpret that. Because the only thing on the right hand that changes, by the way, is Q. We're assuming the mass of the droplets to be very uniform. G is the same. So the only thing that could affect this distribution is the charge. And if, it, if Q is continuously distributed, distributed, all, in other words, all values of Q are allowed for the charge of that droplet, then that's what the graph here would look like. If that's not true, if our graph actually ends up looking like this or something like that, what it means is that the values of Q are given in specific increments, that a one certain value of Q, let's say 10 blogs, gives us this electric field. Let's say a given uh, value of Q, let's say eight blogs, gives us that uh, value of E that balances the, the uh, droplets and so on. So different allowed finite or different allowed quantized values of Q give us different quantized electric fields that balance the charge. So that's specifically what this experiment told us, that whatever gives a matter charge is a quantized thing, that charge does not come in continuous uh, amounts, that if you want to give an oil droplet uh, uh, charge, you have to do it one amount at a time. And specifically what this corresponds with here, the maximum electric field that was able to balance a, a, a charge. So we cranked up as high as we could and above that we couldn't balance anything. So the maximum E field was when we only had one electron. One times the charge of the electron corresponded with this spike right there. In other words, because it only has a tiny amount of charge, you have to put a ton of electric field to, to give it enough force. Obviously, as you add more and more charges to it, you don't need to push that E field up as high to balance it. But if there's only one electron, you have to put a whole bunch of electric field, um, you have to apply a whole bunch of E field to balance it because you're simply multiplying that by one. So that's why it does in fact make sense to label this E1. This is the electric field that balances droplets that only have a single electron. Now, let's say that Q was two electrons. In this case, if you have twice the charge, you only need half the electric field to give the same force. So this gave us that electric field that was exactly half of what we had before. You too. And it's possible there might have only been a few droplets that have one electron. There might be more droplets that have two electrons there. So we might have a higher uh, histogram at that point. 
Now, if we imagine the droplets that had three individual electrons attached to them, three excess, that will give us one third, sorry, one third of that original le electric field value. So that's why, that's where we get E3. And so in other words, as we increase the number of electrons, which we can generically write as N, as we increase how many individual electrons we add to that droplet, excess electrons, I should say, we get a geometrically, you know, uh, close to named series where we can calculate the electric field required to balance N excess electrons from an oil droplet. And so Millikan did this. And he actually experimentally measured uh, what that for, so the easiest way to do this is to measure, uh, sorry, let's backtrack here. So we have this, this formula that will, will predict what exact electric fields the electron uh, will be, the, the N electrons will be balanced at. So the way we're going to analyze this here is we're going to look at this distribution of possible electric field values that have actually resulted in our given you know, balancing act. And we're going to compare it to this equation right there. And the easiest thing to look at first is, okay, wh what electric field level does E1 occur at? So we can analyze this for, for E1, the maximum electric field that allowed us to balance those uh, particles. We can look at this and just substitute N equals 1. So um, E1 should equal mg over QE times 1, or literally, by measuring this, you've just measured that. So we can set the charge of the electron, it's Q little e, simply just equal to whatever we measured there, the mass of those droplets, which is, a, again, a measurable quantity, times G over whatever that first observed electric field peak was. And then you can confirm that based on the, the one half of that is E2, one third of that is E3, one fourth of that is E4, and so on. And once you actually confirm your measured values with the experimental or the theoretical uh, you know, result there, you have literally measured the charge of the electron. And all you got to do now is look back to Thompson's, Thompson's experiment, where we said that Q, QE over ME equaled some value. And once you measure QE, you now measure ME. So at this point, literally over 100 years ago, 1906, we now understood what the mass of the lightest thing that we knew of in the universe was and what the smallest uh, quantity of charge was. And I, I want to stress again how important the fact that Qu uh, charge was not quantized is to our entire theory. That when we talk about quantum physics, we're literally talking about things that are coming in packets like this, that are not divisible. And so this is our first hint of things that are not going to obey continuous mathematics, and that's going to be kind of a theme as we go forwards, but we are going to confuse it by also interleaving some continuous mathematical functions to describe that. So get ready for some fun. <laughs>